a client met his banker to discuss opening a restaurant in a busy airport. In us, he found a partner that understood the importance of reaching for the sky. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 28, for broadcast on the 12th of April, 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world through TuneIn Radio, and as in-flight entertainment aboard Virgin Australia. Coming up on Space Time, the detection of three new fast radio bursts. Astronomers identify the purest, most massive brown dwarf ever seen. And the Event Horizon Telescope begins collecting data for the most detailed image ever made of a black hole. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have used one of Australia's almost forgotten radio telescopes to discover three new fast radio bursts, mysterious nanosecond-long flashes of energy which continue to defy explanation. The team, led by Manisha Caleb from Swinburne University in the ANU, made the discovery using the University of Sydney's Malonglo radio telescope, 40 kilometres from Canberra. Originally built in 1965 as the Malonglo Cross, the telescope featured two 1,600-metre-long crossing arms, one north-south and the other east-west. Each arm was a parabolic wire trough, which gathered cosmic radio waves into a line of feeds running through the trough. In 1978, the north-south arm was shut down. That left the east-west arm to operate in a completely new mode, known as the Malonglo Observatory Synthesis Telescope, or MOST. For a long time, the telescope was almost forgotten, But then fast radio bursts were discovered, and a major upgrade of the observatory was undertaken in 2014 and 2015 to allow it to do new science, hunting for these mysterious bursts which have been tantalising astronomers for almost a decade. The telescope originated from a 1953 ID by the CSIRO's Bernie Mills for a new type of radio telescope, which comprised two crossed arms, allowing it to produce a narrow pencil beam, the region of sky the telescope sees at any one time. This gave Malonglo high resolution. The telescope's sensitivity, that is, its ability to detect weak signals, is dependent on its collecting area, in other words, the surface area capturing radio waves from space. The telescope's resolving power, that is, its ability to see detail, is dependent on its arm length. With Malonglo, these two factors could be altered independently. First discovered almost 10 years ago by the CSIRO's Parkes Radio Telescope, fast radio bursts are millisecond duration intense pulses of radio energy, which appear to be coming from fast distances. They're about a billion times more luminous than anything astronomers have ever seen within our own Milky Way galaxy, and so they represent one of modern astronomy's greatest mysteries. One potential explanation is that they weren't really coming from outer space at all. Instead, it's thought they may have been some form of local interference which was tricking astronomers into searching for new theories to explain their impossible radio energy. Perhaps the most bizarre explanation of all, however, is that fast radio bursts were alien transmissions or warp drives on advanced alien starships. Conventional single-dish radio telescopes have had difficulty establishing that these transmissions originate from beyond Earth's atmosphere. And that's why Malonglo opens a new window into fast radio burst research. In 2013, scientists and engineers realised that the Malongolo telescope's unique architecture could place a minimum distance on fast radio bursts due to its enormous focal length. A massive re-engineering effort then began, which is now opening a new window on the universe. Malongolo's huge 18,000 square metre collecting area and its large field of view covering some 8 square degrees of the sky makes it ideal for hunting for fast radio bursts. Caleb developed the software to sift through the 1,000 terabytes of data being produced by Malonglo each day. And her work paid off with three new fast radio burst discoveries. She says additional funding, which has now been approved by the Australian Research Council, will allow further upgrades to the observatory, 
eventually allowing astronomers to localise fast radio bursts to individual galaxies. Figuring out exactly where a fast radio burst comes from will be key to understanding what's making them. So far only one burst, a repeater, has been linked to a specific galaxy, and Malongolo will allow many more to finally be pinned down. The fast radio bursts are the first, what we say, coherent emitters outside our galactic neighbourhood. So these FRBs sort of carry the fingerprint of the intervening medium that they travel through, and we can use this to exploit them as a cosmological hub. So FRBs are characterised by what we call large dispersion measures. Now, dispersion measure is simply an account of the number of electrons that it has travelled through. So naively, you'd say the larger the dispersion measure, the further away your source appears to be. Now, the dispersion measures of these FRBs place them at halfway across the universe. So we could potentially use them to understand the missing baryon matter problem, or we could even use them to measure the magnetic fields of the intergalactic medium for the first time. We think most of the missing baryons are located in the plasma within the intergalactic space along the filaments and connecting nodes in the large-scale structure of the universe. And this could, because we're looking halfway across the universe... Exactly. So we think that this FRB would have interacted with all those electrons. Over 7 billion light years worth. Yes, that's quite a lot. It's pretty amazing. You didn't just find one, you found three of them. Are you exactly. able to determine where they were in space or you know roughly how far away they are? Can you determine what direction they came from? So the cool thing about Malongo is it's a sort of a telescope, what we call an interferometer. So single dish antennas, so most FRBs have been found with single dish antennas. The drawback with these antennas is that they have difficulty establishing where the transmissions actually originate from. So you don't really know whether it's from your backyard or it's from 10,000 kilometers away. Now, Malongo is an interferometer. In astronomy, the larger the dish is, the larger the collecting area, but unfortunately, it only sees a small patch of sky. Now, the inverse is true for a smaller dish. It sees a smaller, it sees a larger patch of sky, though it does have a small collecting area. Now, with an interferometer, you can sort of tie together a lot of small dishes together, and in this way, you retain the field of view, so you see a large patch of sky. At the same time, you have a large collecting area. Professor Matthew Bales, in in 2013, he realized that Malongo was a potential gold mine for FRB discoveries, primarily because of its large field of view. And a large field of view is absolutely brilliant when you're doing blind searches. So they worked towards transforming this into a burst finding machine. And in 2013, when the project started, they had about five FRBs. So there were a lot of unanswered questions at that point in time. And Malonglo, yes, there, there are plenty of unanswered questions, but at that point in time, Malonglo seemed like an app telescope to be able to even begin answering some of these unanswered questions. When they talk about fast radio bursts, they're very powerful blasts of energy, primarily at radio wavelengths, but they only last for very short periods of time. That's right. I guess because they are so short and so powerful, they would have stood out from other things? So that's probably, they only last a few milliseconds, so that's about one thousandth of a second. So you need extremely high time resolution for you to be able to even identify an FRB. Now, we have 352 little telescopes. So we have 352 little antennas that tie together to form this interferometer. So we receive signals from each of these telescopes and it's digitized and it's combined to form a much cleaner signal. On average a day, we get about 200,000 DVDs worth of data where a DVD is about 5 gigabytes. Mm. So the huge amount of data that flows through is quite intimidating and looking for a burst is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So the biggest challenge in finding them is processing and we want to process the data as soon as we can in order to find them. So this is where actually the video games industry comes in because they created these super fast cards called GPUs and we have about 54 of these in a mini supercomputer on site. So it munches through the data pretty quickly. And the software we've developed, it does help you throw away a lot of data, which has interference in it. And you can sort of, sort of narrow down the potential FRB candidates, but nothing can really beat eyeballing the data to see if it really does look like what you think you want it to look like. I've probably looked through over 200,000 potential FRB candidates over the last two years. And when you extrapolate that out to how many searches have been done for FRBs and the fact that less than two dozen of them have been found since they were first discovered, that's a lot of work. <laughs> that most definitely is. But things, it also depends on how much time you get on a telescope. So most telescopes, uh, you need to apply for time on it and then you're granted time. But along with the cool thing is we have almost exclusive access to the telescope. So we spend about 18 
hours a day on average searching for these birds. But the thing is, they only last one thousandth of a second, so they're quite easy to miss as well. There was a time not all that long ago when they were thinking of closing Malongolo down because they didn't think it would be used for anything, especially with things like the SKA coming online and now fast radio bursts has changed all that completely. That is indeed very true. Malongolo has been around for about 50 years and I guess it's most well for its discovery of the Vila Pulsar in the 1960s and the telescope has had a fair share of ups and downs since then, but I guess things are looking up now. It's been completely refitted with a new digital system, um, thanks to funding from the Australian Research Council and support from the late uh, George Collins, who was the head of research at Swinburne. He was always a strong advocate of the project, so the telescope has literally been reborn and transformed into a machine to hunt for these birds. We used to have similar interferometers around Sydney as well, and they were shut down. Whenever I hear of any scientific instrument being shut down, it always makes me very sad and and very angry that this is happening. It it just seems to be the wrong thing. I'm glad Malongolo survived. I'm very glad Malongolo survived. If it wasn't for Malongolo, we wouldn't have made the first interferometric detections of FRBs. So that is a pretty big deal, I think. What you've done, how does that improve our understanding of fast radio bursts? So the thing is, all the FRBs that were discovered um, till now, like I said, they're the single-dish antenna. So you don't really know how far away they are. But with Malongolo, we've sort of established scientifically that FRBs are extra terrestrial in nature. So when we first started looking for FRBs, it was more an act of faith because in 2013, we didn't really know whether they emitted at this frequency. And then in 2015, when the Green Bank found one, we knew that it was only a matter of time before we discovered one because it was at the same frequency as our operating frequency. We now know with our three discoveries that they don't have a local origin and that was the primary goal of the project. And this sort of motivates us towards our next step of the project, which is to identify the galaxy that occurs in. So earlier this year, Arecibo found an FRB and they detected it at the Green Bank Telescope as well. Now, they were able to establish it as being extraterrestrial only because it repeated. But with Malonglo, we know that it doesn't have to repeat for us to be able to term it as being extraterrestrial or extragalactic. Ideally, we'd like to localize the burst as soon is it goes off. And this is what we're aiming for with the Atmos 2D project at Malonglo. Right now, in terms of localization, we've got a long line on the sky and the FRB could have basically gone off anywhere in that line. Now, Malonglo is what we call a milk cross design. So it has, so the telescope has two arms which intersect one another in the form of a cross. And currently, it's only one arm of the telescope that's fully operational. And this arm gives you a line in the sky. Now, with the Atmos 2D project, uh, we hope to bring the other arm online within the year. So when is up and running, you get two lines on the sky in a giant X centered on the bus. So essentially, X will mark the spot where the pulse is coming from and we potentially can localise a host galaxy. It was originally thought FRBs would be a signature of some sort of cataclysmic event that would destroy a star or something like that, form a black hole, whatever. That's right. But the discovery of a repeating FRB, that sort of changed that a lot, hasn't it? It has in... It, it certainly has, but astronomers have spent several hundred hours following up known positions of known FRBs. And surprisingly, this is the only FRB that has been seen to repeat. Well, it could be that we're sort of limited by sensitivity and the pulses from other positions of the FRBs are just not as bright as you'd expect them to be able to detect them with the telescope you're observing. Or it could simply just be that there are indeed two classes of FRBs. Current idea is maybe it's something to do with a AGN and because of the way space is moving and everything's moving in space, we only get at one fleeting look at it before it disappears forever, pointing in a different direction. Unless, of course, it's really aliens. <laughs> We've gone down that road before with pulsars, and pulsars were first discovered. They were termed, I mean, the first pulsar was called the Little Green Man. And, well, FRBs are similar to pulsars in terms of their pulse width and in terms of the dispersion sweep except that FRBs have large dispersion measures which place them halfway across the universe and pulsars are in our galaxy. And FRBs are much, much more energetic. And one very important question I need to ask you, we've been able to rule mm-hmm. out that it's not someone opening the door of a microwave oven? <laughs> yes, we have. So the cool thing about an interferometer is that it has a large focal length, so you can sort of place a minimum distance at which these bursts occur. So with Malonglo, it's at about 10,000 kilometres, so we know that these bursts occur at or beyond the 10,000 kilometre limit. I've got to tell our listeners the story here. For a while there, a number of radio bursts were being detected at the same time every day and scientists couldn't work out what it was. And then all of a sudden they realised there was a particular astronomer who shall remain nameless as lunchtime. And they had 
this habit of <laughs> opening the microwave oven door as soon as the timer went down to zero, but just before the, the microwaves had totally shut off. And so there'd always be this little leak as that person opened the door to take out their lunch. And that's what it was. <laughs> that's right. When you, yeah, when you look at, well, the peritons, when you look at them, they all sort of peak at lunchtime, so... <laughs> That's Manisha Caleb from Swinburne University and the ANU. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered the most massive brown dwarf ever seen. A report in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society claims the record-breaking object known as SDSS J0104 plus 1535 also has the purest composition of any brown dwarf ever observed. Brown dwarfs are special. They fill the gap between the largest planets and the smaller stars. Brown dwarfs are a little bigger and usually between 30 and 80 times more massive than gas giants like Jupiter. Interestingly, Jupiter generates more heat than it receives from the Sun. If the Jovian giant were a little bit more massive, it would have become a brown dwarf. However, while brown dwarfs usually lack the mass to sustain core nuclear hydrogen fusion, a process which makes stars like our sunshine, more massive brown dwarfs are thought to be capable of fusing both deuterium and lithium. And some of the most massive brown dwarfs may well start out their lives on the main sequence as spectral type M red dwarf stars. It's a fuzzy line. The newly detected brown dwarf SDSS J0104 plus 1535 was discovered in the galactic halo, the outermost reaches of our Milky Way galaxy. The galactic halo is made up of the most ancient stars. Located some 750 light years away in the constellation Pisces the fish, SDSS J0104 plus 1535 is made of gas that's around 250 times more pure than the sun. In other words, it consists of some 99.99% pure hydrogen and helium, the elements which originated in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. To have such low metallicity means this brown dwarf must have formed at least 10 billion years ago. By the way, astronomers refer to everything on the periodic table other than hydrogen and helium as metals. Measurements suggest this newly found brown dwarf has a mass equivalent to some 90 times that of Jupiter, making it the most massive brown dwarf ever found. It was previously not known if brown dwarfs could form from such pure primordial gas. And so this discovery points the way to a larger undiscovered population of extremely pure brown dwarfs from our galaxy's ancient past. The study's lead author, Dr. Zheng Hu Zhang from the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canary Islands, says he never expected to see brown dwarfs this pure. He says having found one, though, often suggests a much larger hitherto undiscovered population. Zhang says he'd be both surprised if there weren't many more similar objects out there just waiting to be found. SDSS J0104 plus 1535 has been classified as a spectral type L ultra sub dwarf based on its optical and near infrared spectrum as measured by the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, the VLT. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have begun using a powerful array of telescopes to undertake the first ever detailed image of the black hole at the centre of our galaxy. The Event Horizon Telescope is an international joint effort to link some of the world's most powerful radio telescopes to examine Sagittarius A star, a supermassive black hole, some 4.3 million times the mass of our Sun, located about 27,000 light years away in the galactic centre. These observations will help astronomers sort through the multitude of hypotheses that currently exist about black holes. Therefore, the data obtained by these new observations will allow scientists to finally understand things about black holes they've never understood before. 
At the very heart of Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity is the idea that quantum mechanics, the study of the universe at the subatomic level, and relativity theory, Einstein's study of the universe on cosmic scales, can be melded into a single grand unified theory of fundamental concepts. And the place to study that is the event horizon of a black hole. In all of physics, extreme limits are the most interesting, because that's where our understanding of physics breaks down, and consequently where new discoveries are made. The Global Event Horizon Project, led by MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uses a method known as VLBI, or Very Long Baseline Interferometry. VLBI involves radio telescopes across the world all being linked together to create one single huge telescope the size of the Earth. Although the technique of Very Long Baseline Interferometry isn't new, scientists have only just recently begun extending it into millimetre radio wavelengths in order to further boost its resolving power by including ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimetre Submillimetre Array in Chile. Before this project, the 60-plus dishes of the ALMA Observatory only worked with each other to make observations as a single array. With ALMA joining the observation, so much data will now be produced, it's going to be quicker to fly the petabytes of information to MIT's Haystack Observatory rather than send it electronically. Once at Haystack, the data will be correlated and processed to create what will be the first detailed images ever of a black hole. Correlation, which registers the data from all the participating telescopes to account for the different arrival times of the radio waves at each site, is done by using a specialised bank of powerful supercomputers. MIT is one of the few radio science facilities worldwide with the necessary technology and expertise to correlate this amount of data. Additional correlation for these sessions will be done at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. The end result should be some of the highest resolution images ever obtained of a black hole. In fact, the improved level of detail is equivalent to being able to count the stitches on a cricket or baseball from 130,000 kilometres away. There are two observing sessions taking place. The Global Millimetre VLBI Array session will observe a variety of sources at a wavelength of 3 millimetres, including Sagittarius A star and other active galactic nuclei. The Event Horizon Telescope session will observe Sagittarius A star, as well as the supermassive black hole at the centre of the nearby giant elliptical galaxy M87, at a wavelength of 1.3 millimetres. Several factors make 1.3 millimetres the ideal observing wavelength for Sagittarius A star. At shorter wavelengths, the Earth's atmosphere tends to absorb most of the signal. And at longer observing wavelengths, the source would be blurred by free electrons between Earth and the galactic centre. That means astronomers wouldn't have enough resolution to see the long predicted but never seen black hole shadow. Although black holes aren't visible, it's hypothesised they cast shadows in front of a bright background. Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts that there should be this shadowy circle around the black hole, and its shape should put important constraints on the black hole's mass and spin. But these ideas have never previously been tested. Another of the Event Horizon Telescope's goals is to study the physics of accretion, the process by which a black hole's gravity pulls in nearby matter. The infalling material forms a flattened band of spinning matter around the event horizon called an accretion disk. The Event Horizon Telescope will help scientists understand the genesis and behaviour of large plasma jets launched outwards from feeding black holes perpendicular to the accretion disk. Another intriguing idea that may be explored in this experiment is the so-called information paradox, Stephen Hawking's prediction that matter falling into a black hole cannot be lost beyond the known universe. Instead, it must somehow leak back into the universe through Hawking radiation, that is the formation and destruction of pairs of virtual particles at the event horizon. By making these first direct observations of the event horizon, astronomers should be able to determine its mass, thereby providing scientists with the unique opportunity to study the extreme physics involved in these mysterious objects. These current observations are the first in a series of groundbreaking studies in very long baseline interferometry that will enable dramatic new scientific discoveries to be made. Data from the newly phased ALMA array will also allow better imaging of other distant radio sources through improved data sampling, increased angular resolution, and eventually spectral line very long baseline interferometry. In other words, observations of emissions from specific elements and molecules. The black hole images from the data being gathered this month will take several more months to prepare. Researchers expect to publish their first results early next year. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Well, it's amazing how quickly time flies.
especially when you're making history at almost 52,000 kilometres per hour. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft is now halfway from its close encounter with Pluto to its next encounter, a flyby of the Kuiper Belt object 2014 MU69. The probe will encounter this distant mysterious world on January 1st, 2019. New Horizons is now 782.45 million kilometres beyond Pluto. New Horizons principal investigator Alan Stern from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says the encounter will set a new record for the most distant world ever explored in the history of human civilization. The probe's also just passed the halfway point in time between its closest approach to Pluto, which occurred back at 7.48 a.m. United States Eastern Time on July 14, 2015, and MU69, which is predicted for 2 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time on New Year's Day 2019. The nearly five-day difference between the halfway markers for distance and time are due to the gravitational pull of the Sun. New Horizons is actually getting a little bit slower as it pulls further away from the Sun's gravity. So the spacecraft crosses the midway point in distance a bit before it passes the midway point in time. New Horizons has now commenced a new period of hibernation. The scheduled 157-day hibernation is well-deserved. The probe's been awake for almost two and a half years since December 6, 2014. Since then, in addition to its historic Pluto encounter and the 16 subsequent months of relaying all that data from its encounter back to Earth, New Horizons made breakthrough distant observations of a dozen other Kuiper Belt objects, collecting unique data on the dust and charged particle environment of the Kuiper Belt and stating the hydrogen gas which permeates the vast space surrounding the Sun called the heliosphere. The Kuiper Belt is a distant ring of comets, frozen worlds and icy debris circling the Sun beyond the orbit of Neptune. In addition to MU69, NASA plans to study more than two dozen other known Kuiper Belt objects and measure the charged particle and dust environment all the way across the Kuiper Belt. New Horizons is currently 5.7 billion kilometres from Earth. At that distance, a radio signal sent from mission managers, travelling at the speed of light, needs about 5 hours and 20 minutes to reach the spacecraft. Mission controls say all New Horizons systems are healthy and operating normally, and the spacecraft is on course for its MU69 flyby. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. The World Meteorological Organization have announced confirmation of the biggest wave ever detected. A massive rogue measuring some 19 metres or 62.3 feet as tall as a six-storey building. The record-breaking wave formed in the North Atlantic Ocean between the United Kingdom and Iceland. Although only recently confirmed, the wave itself actually occurred way back on February 4, 2013. It followed the passage of a very strong cold front producing winds of 43.8 knots. The previous record for the biggest wave ever recorded by a buoy also happened in the North Atlantic Ocean just over five years earlier, on December 8, 2007. It measured some 18.275 metres, or 59.96 feet. The World Meteorological Organization says it's the first time scientists have ever measured a rogue wave over 19 metres high. Wave heights are measured as the distance between the crest and the trough. Waves can be caused by a number of different factors, from the gravitational pull of the Moon or the Sun to underwater earthquakes. However, most rogue waves are caused simply by the force of the wind hitting the surface of the water. Scientists need high-quality and extensive ocean records to help their understanding of weather-ocean interactions. Despite huge strides in satellite technology, the sustained observations and data records from moored and drifting buoys and ships still play a major role in studying these extraordinary events. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The shows also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and junk on the web I find interesting, important or amusing. 
Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.